Hello and welcome to this Bristol Ideas online event. My name is Zoe Stedman Milne and I'm the creative content producer for Bristol Ideas. Today's conversation is part of a year round project we've been running in Bristol and online, Modernism 1922. It ran as a tribute to Kevin Jackson, whose book Constellation of Genius 1922 Modernism and All That Jazz tells the story of that remarkable year. 1922 saw the publication of James Joyce's Ulysses and T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, the first year of consistently significant silent film releases and many important artworks. We've been exploring this year of cultural significance with film screenings, discussions and new commissions. Do head to the Bristol Ideas website um, for the projects you can see and more information and we will include links below this as well. I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. Jade Munslow Ong for today's conversation. Dr. Jade Munslow Ong is reader in English literature at the University of Salford and principal investigator on a three-year AHRC funded research project, South African Modernism 1880 to 2020. She's author of Olive Schreiner's and African Modernisms, Allegory, Empire and Post-Colonial Writing and has two books forthcoming, a co-authored book with Matthew Whittle entitled Global Literatures and the Environment, 21st Century Perspectives and a co-edited edition with Andrew van der Vlees entitled Olive Schreiner Writing Networks and Global Context. Um, I imagine we will probably touch on both those books. Jade is also a 2022 BBC AHRC New Generation Thinker and has featured on programmes on BBC Radio 3. Jade, welcome. Thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you. Glad to be here. Shall we start with uh, your research project? Can you tell us a little bit more about how you came to this particular period of South African writing? Um, sure. Well, I did. I did my PhD on a South African writer called Olive Schreiner. Um, she was the first South African novelist and first new woman writer. So um, when I finished um, the PhD and then I turned it into the book, um, that you mentioned, I, I made the argument that Olive Schreiner is best interpreted as a modernist writer. Um, and I, I talked a little bit about how her three novels um, might be more, more kind of usefully or accurately interpreted as modernist texts, even though they sit slightly outside the times and periods um, and places that we associate with modernism. Um, so then when the book was finished, I turned to thinking about other South African writers. And actually um, I kind of, I, I, I felt that uh, modernism as a kind of an artistic and philosophical movement um, really persisted um, in various forms and not you know, across all literature, but kind of persisted um, throughout the 19th, 20th and 21st century writers. So that you have um, writers from across these periods, writers like J.M. Kutsia, even you know, much more recently, um, last year's Booker Prize winner, Damon Galgut, they're still described as late modernist writers, even though you know, Olive Schreiner was doing it way back in the, in the 1880s too. So um, we came up with this project Andrew van der Vlees, who's based at the University of Adelaide, and I, to um, research South African modernism across this long time period, the end of the 19th century to the 21st century. And we're interested in examining how South African personal and literary networks help to shape global modernisms, why it persists as a useful form and um, set of ideas and forms of representation for engaging with the politics and economics and changing social contexts of South Africa. And finally, we look at how um, South African modernism relates to and compares to other global forms of modernist writing. So just a, just a, 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 small, a small sort of thing <laughs> that you want to cover. <laughs> Three years and lots of people on board, so it's not just us. <laughs> Um, I suppose one of the sort of big parts of any type of research project is how you kind of how you sort of get this information. And obviously you're sort of saying you're here in the UK. Um, John, um, was it John? Uh, no, yeah. Andrew. Andrew, sorry. Andrew is in um, Australia and you're researching essentially work and art and things that were happening in South Africa. So how did you sort of go about that? Um, we had um, a lovely trip to South Africa um, this year, so I was there for nine weeks this year working in um, the archives at um, the Bailey's African History Archive in Johannesburg and the incredible um, Amazi Museum of um, South African Literature in Grahamstown, Makanda. Um, so we spent a good few weeks there. Um, you know, we, we are able to get text, text move internationally now. So it's, it's you can get your hands on quite a few. Um, and, and, you know, we have lots of colleagues that we work with. We work with um, a colleague from 
um, who works between Uppsala University and Salford, where we're based, and we work alongside colleagues at Rhodes. And the collection that you mentioned, the edited collection, we have contributors from all over the world. So people working on how Olive Schreiner's South African modernisms relate to New Zealand modernisms, Indian modernisms, um, Australian modernisms. So, um, so we've got lots of people kind of doing different, different work there. So should we talk a little bit more about Olive Schreiner? Because obviously, you know, she's hugely important, but I think uh, she's probably one of those writers that un unless someone has kind of physically gone, you must read Olive Schreiner, <laughs> you're not, you wouldn't come across her, would you? So do you want to tell us a little bit more about Olive Schreiner? Sure. Um, so um, she was born in 1855. She's the daughter of um, missionary parents, um, an English mother and a German father who traveled to South Africa to um, do missionary work. She, they were very poor. She was one of a number of siblings and they were they were raised very kind of peripatetic, but they were raised primarily in these kind of um, semi-desert area of South Africa called the Karoo. Very limited access to things like books and resources. And Olive Schreiner um, began to write, and she was writing as a teenager, um, working as a governess, she was 15, and so she'd have to look after the children by day, and then at night she would kick open the door of her kind of mud-walled um, like outbuilding where she was staying, and write books by the light of the moon, because she had no other source of light. So she's 15 in the semi-desert, writing these um, novels that would end up being these incredible feminist, experimental um, texts. And, and her first novel that she published, she only published one novel in her lifetime, um, which was The Story of an African Farm, came out in 1883. She took it, the manuscripts to Britain when she intended to... Um, um, train as a nurse, but she she wasn't able to do so because of ill health. Um, but she managed to get the manuscript published in 1883, and then um, it made a bit of a, a kind of an impact. It was the it was a kind of very strongly feminist novel. It didn't look like any other literature about you know Africa. It wasn't an adventure um, or imperial romance text. Um, and um, she was read by lots of radical circles and immediately became one of these kind of literary figures. So she was friends with. Um, kind of radical socialists like Edward Carpenter and Henry Havelock Ellis and, um, and Edith Lees. And she began to move in circles with like naturalist writers like George Moore and Margaret Harkness, symbolist writers like Amy Levy. She published in Oscar Wilde's The Woman's World, for example. So she became quite well known. Um, and then this, this, this kind of the story in African Farm, um, really kind of cemented her reputation. So she then began to publish kind of shorter allegories and then like in the collection Dreams and then became known as a, a political writer. So she she wrote pacifist tracts, um, a big feminist text called Woman and Labour that apparently Charlotte Perkins Gilman always carried with her, you know, the author of the yellow wallpaper. She always had that in a copy. A copy. Bag. Yeah, and, and even, you know, the film Suffragette that came out in 2015. So the, the opening of that film is um, a lines from Shriner's Dreams. And, and the copy of the book that I think the is the, the Emily Davison character hands to the Carrie Mulligan character. Sorry, I don't know what her name is in the film. She hands a copy of Shriner's Dreams before she throws herself under the hooves of the horse, uh, of the king's horse in the film. So I don't know if it's true, but that's what they use, this kind of this Shriner text, this key feminist um, text. And um, she's a really important figure in, in those kind of contexts. So I think more people should read her work. I think more people should, um, should, should read what she was writing about. Absolutely. How old was she when she wrote that? Um, so 15, 16. Really? Th yeah. That young? That's mm -hmm. quite, a, it's kind of quite astounding to think about, especially when you think about sort of a lot of the writers of that time being so sort of strongly rooted in, uh, you know, you, where you just think of a lot of, a lot of sort of old white men, don't you really? It's kind of astounding to think of this teenage girl having such a massive impact, I suppose. Absolutely. And, and then, you know, and canonical modernists, um, People like you mentioned James Joyce at the start. So um, in, in a portrait of the artist as a young man, um, there is a scene um, in which a saint has a vision of hell as a ticking of a great clock, the ceaseless repetition of the words never, ever, never, ever. 
But 30 years earlier, in, in this kind of story in African farm, this text that Schreiner wrote, um, this character Waldo lies in bed, um, having this existential crisis at the start of the novel. And it's prompted by the tick, tick, tick of a hunting watch that becomes the dying, dying, dying of people going to hell. So this like standard, this kind of modernist clock image, it appears in um, D.H. Lawrence's Women in Love as well, for example. And there's lots of interesting time in Virginia Woolf's Orlando. So that, that modernist clock image that we, we see as a hallmark of modernism, Schreiner arrived at that 30 years before even, you know, writers like James Joyce. Uh, and then other modernist writers read Schreiner. Um, so Wolf Red Schreiner, D.H. Lawrence Red Schreiner, um, and I think there are definitely some kind of intriguing kind of lines of influence um, there too. That is fascinating. I suppose just before we move on, why do you think she isn't as widely known as, for example, Wolf or T.H. Lawrence? Um, I think, you know, um, very simply because um, she's not in the times and places that we associate with modernist writing. You know, she's she's 30 or 40 years too early. <laughs> she's um, in South Africa. She's, she's reasonably well known in... Um, it kind of end of the 19th century kind of feminist studies. Um, Andrew Van Vliet, who's on our project, is actually um, producing, editing a new issue of Shriners, the story of an African farm that will, will be out with Edinburgh University Press in, in the next year or two. Um, so hopefully there is going to be a wider global readership for Shriner, um, you know, in the years to come. Um, she's, you know, reasonably well known in South Africa. They have a, a Shriner House Museum in in Craddock. There's there's ex exhibits on Shriner in even in the um, Apartheid Museum. There's a there's an exhibit on Shriner there. So she's well known in, in South Africa, but um, but maybe not as well known everywhere else. Um, should we move on to um, the three other South um, African writers that you talk about in your research? Do you want to sort of introduce them and a little bit? So this idea of a, of a sort of a, a relation, a relationship, a writing group that they founded together. Um, yeah, so when we think about um, kind of modernism in England, we often think about Bloomsbury as this kind of uniquely privileged site of modernist innovation um, and the Bloomsbury group. Um, but there are actually three um, white South African writers who were kind of, you know, associated with, with this group. So there was um, Roy Campbell, um, William Plumer and Lawrence van der Post. And they, um, they kind of, they began to kind of either publish with, with the Hogarth Press, so William Plumer, ended up being one of the most prolific authors with, with Leonard and Virginia Woolf's um, Hogarth Press. And he published his first novel, Turbot Woolf, in 1925. And then he introduced um, Lawrence van der Post, who published In a Province with um, the Hogarth Press in 1934. So you've got South African modernists publishing with, you know, it, with the British English modernists. Um, and then there was this other figure, Roy Campbell, um, who worked alongside Plumer and um, Van der Post, and together they created a, um, a magazine called Forslach, so Whiplash, and this magazine was very critical, this in South Africa, in Durban, and this magazine was very critical of colonial um, structures and the racism of South African colonial society. And they ended up having to abandon the magazine and, and leave South Africa, um, which is kind of how um, Pluma, you know, began to publish with, with Hogarth Press. But Roy Campbell had this really interesting kind of relationship, set of relationships with the Bloomsbury Group because um, his, he, was, he was a poet and he was married to an English woman called Mary Garman. And they became friends with Beta Sackville West and, um, and Harold Nicholson. And then Mary, Roy's wife, had an affair with Beta Sackville West. And this love affair inspired Sackville West's uh, poetry collection called A King's Daughter from 1929. Virginia Woolf was heartbroken, <laughs> desperate to win back um, Sackville West, Peter Sackville West. So she tries to win back her affections by writing the novel Orlando, which was um, described by um, Sackville West's nephew as, as the longest and most charming love letter in literature. Um, and then Roy Campbell found out about the affair and was furious. He had a real temper, um, Roy Campbell. And he wrote the 1931 poem, The Georgiad, 
in which he denounces the Williamsburg group. He creates he creates um, a Beta Sack West character called Andrew Gino and absolutely kind of destroys <laughs> her over the course of this poem. And then describes the Bloomsbury group as intellects without intellect, sexless folk whose sexes intersect. So, um, so what you have there in this kind of late 1920s, early 1930s period are these really important South African personal and textual connections that play an absolutely vital role in the development of both South African and English modernisms. It was a really um, generative source of inspiration, albeit piqued by intense emotions. Um, but what, what I think it shows is that you know, South African writers aren't belated arrivals to modernism. They're not um, imitative or they're not coming later. You know, South African modernism isn't made possible by earlier European modernisms, actually. South African modernists are, are, are producing modernist texts before, alongside, in collaboration with a lot of these canonical writers that, that we know. And well, I suppose one of the things you have to kind of remember at this time is the fact that um, you know everything took much longer so physically getting to places took much longer physically you know writing and exchanging letters took much longer so actually for all of this to happen this would have this would have spanned yeah what sort of the span of this would have been years I suppose just thinking about how things developed it wasn't sort of like you know someone you know sent a message put, called someone on the phone it was very much about these, these sort of you know long trips or letters that have to kind of cross over oceans. Yeah, well, um, at this time, we actually had um, Pluma and Campbell and Van der Post in Britain. So we actually had them in, in England at this kind of like this tension, these kind of period like 1928, 29, 30, 31. Um, and then they went off to different places, you know, um, Van der Post and, and Pluma had spent time in Japan, for example. Um, and um, and then the the um, the Campbells ended up going to Europe for, for a long time to Portugal. So yes, there, there was a lot, kind of a lot of movement, but I think that's also um, part and parcel of what the, the modernisms that they create. I think modernisms are um, often bicultural. They often work at the interface of these kind of um, African and European ideas and art forms. Um, and I think I think that that's what that's what helps, you know, that's a really generative source. That's that's what made modernism possible actually was empire, was travel, was movement. Um, in terms of kind of um pace, that question of pace and how long it took to do things, I think um Again, I'm, I'm not sure I have a perfect answer to this, but I don't think it was as much of, an, of a concern for these white writers who were much more mobile than um, perhaps the black modernists who were also beginning to emerge at the same time. They found it much harder to find a place for their work and, and, and um, their kind of voices. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I think um, one of the things to say about um, a place to begin might be that you know we don't tend to associate black African writers with modernism um, the 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 figure that we think about or that we talk about as the father of modern African literature is Chinua Achebe who um, published Things Fall Apart I think in 1958 I think it was 1958 yeah. um, um, and that's um, and, and things fall apart. He, so he's a Nigerian writer, not a South African writer. And, and, the, and that title of that book comes from Yeats's 1920 poem, The Second Coming. So the idea there is that Chinua Achebe is able to write modern African literature because Yeats was there first. So, uh, you know, an, uh, kind of a, 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 there was a white European um, modernist writer, and then Chinua Achebe's work is kind of that belated or imitative form and that's what allows him to be described as modernist um, whereas what i think happens in south africa is i think that um, there are actually examples of black modernist writers working as early as the kind of the 1920s so um so first of all I guess there was, you know, there wasn't an, a kind of an opportunity before then to develop a kind of a, a, a literary culture based in kind of novels and poetry. And um, because, um, you know, the missionary schooling kind of had to kind of take place and, and, and in order to make that possible. And so what you have is the rise in the kind of the 1920s of a, a black intelligentsia and um, writers like Solomon Pikey. Um, Herbert Lomo and his brother, um, 
you know, th these writers are beginning to um, pick up these forms that they get from their missionary school and things like the Bible and John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and they're rewriting them and reworking them into novel forms or into poetry or doing translations uh, of these texts. Um, now, Solomon Pikey is a really interesting figure, um, I think, and one of the most important figures that we look at. Um, he wrote the novel Moody. It was the first novel written by a black African. Um, so anywhere on the continent, apparently. Um, it wasn't the first published. Um, one of the Tlomo brothers managed to get in there first with African tragedy, but it's the first written. So finished in 1920. Um, but he couldn't get it published for 10 years. Um, and even then, he could only get it published with the missionary press and heavily edited. So it only came out in 1930. So I think there's a there's a point there about black modernist writers not being able to reach Euro modernist audiences um, in the way that the white South African writers could. And yet this text is incredible. So Moody is like this, and she is a um, um, an incredible kind of feminist character, really um, a black female leader. Um, it's it's a text that um, kind of blends again these kind of um, African kind of oral cultures and, and forms with, you know, the, the English novel. Um, there's a little bit of kind of imperial romance um, in there. There is um, kind of references to Shakespeare, dream interludes, kind of um, African cultures. It's very, it's kind of, again, a very experimental hybrid text, I think is best interpreted as a work of modernist literature. But I think maybe the most remarkable thing about this novel is that Solomon Pikey did manage to go to the UK because he was also a political figure. So he was um, the first secretary general of the SANNC, so the precursor to the ANC, Nelson Mandela's party, the still ruling party of South Africa. So he went to the UK and the place where he finished writing Moody, this modernist novel, was at number 43 Tavistock Square four years before the wolves moved into number 52. So he's right in Bloomsbury. He's in the places we associate with modernist writing, writing a modernist text that you then can't get out there uh, for another 10 years. And that's such a, such a strange, you know, when you think about sort of strange, bizarre coincidences, how the world works, how, how odd is that? How, you know, it's, it's just, yeah, it's quite sort of bizarre to think about. And the fact, like you sort of say, that sort of, you know, the, the not being able to get published at that point. Yeah. It must, but but also being able to get to London to yeah. be doing all this other work to go. I'm also going to write a novel. Yeah. yeah, it's quite sort of astounding, really. And how how old was he? I suppose when all this was going, I'm always fascinated to know how. It's kind of slightly depressing how young everybody is when they're doing these amazing things. <laughs> That's true. I actually don't know. I actually I can't think. He he must have been a pretty pretty young man. I can. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. He can't have been that old. He um. He crossed over with Olive Schreiner. He met Olive Schreiner. She was much older than him. So obviously she's working kind of 40 years before he is. But um, they they met each other actually in London. And they and he really admired um, Olive Schreiner as a writer, as a thinker. Um, and he actually named his first daughter, one of his daughters, Olive, after Olive oh. Schreiner. Um, so these kind of politically kind of astute, very kind of radical, um, progressive writers and thinkers from South Africa are kind of overlapping and in contact with each other. And there is this kind of these narratives of development you can trace. And importantly, you can trace across black and white writers. You know, they're not as, as separate as, as, you know, the kind of the colonial structures and then later apartheid, you know, tried to maintain them. You know, so a lot of these writers like Plumer, for example, and Turbot Wolf, um, they're writing about interracial relationships and writing about these forms of connection across races um, that make them so radical and, and, and exciting at the time. And obviously, again, probably would have been reason enough for them not to be published, just, I suppose, specifically in South Africa. Absolutely. So Pl when Plumer published Turbot Wolf, it caused um, a real outcry <laughs> because Turbot Wolf is um, is about interracial um, relationship. And actually he suggests that um, the term then was, was miscegenation. So the, the production of mixed race children, he proposes that actually as a kind of a solution to the race problem of South Africa. So you can see why that caused an absolute um, 
kind of outcry. Um, it was it was something that you know wasn't acceptable to this kind of colonial South African um, kind of way of life. And he was he was very critical of them in the novel. You know, he's saying you know this supposed white benevolence is actually um, wreaking untold damage on on the black populations of South Africa. Um, so, and again, Herbert Wolf is disjointed, it's an experimental novel, there's a shift between oral recollections, diary entries, letters, articles. So, um, again, they're expressing these radical ideas using modernist forms, which I think is the, the really that kind of blend of the aesthetics and politics I think is so exciting about this early South African modernist writing. No, absolutely. It, sound, it sounds absolutely fascinating. And how, how is he sort of regarded in South Africa now? Again, um, Pluma, so Plyke is, is an icon, <laughs> you know, Plyke yeah. is um, an icon. Pluma, um, you know, maybe maybe less well known. Um, um, Campbell is such a weird guy. <laughs> he, he, um, he's really kind of, I think he's really kind of studied in academic circles because he his he had so many kind of changes in his life. He went from this kind of radical anti-colonial anti-colonialist and kind of anti-racist to um kind of supporting a fascist government and um becoming like really kind of embedded kind of deep Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Um he was a real conundrum, Roy Campbell. And it, you know, whenever I turn to his work, I think at what point in, in his life are we now? Like what are <laughs> now? What is he thinking at the moment? Um what, you know when so he's he's a struggle. Um so I don't think he's you know kind of quite held up in the in the same same way that these figures like you know Plyke would be or you know maybe even Shriner too. <laughs> Should we talk a little bit about so the two books that you've got um are they coming out well we are now in 2023 are they both coming out this year oh hopefully <laughs> hopefully um, it's always always you know, I hate asking these questions when you know that there's a book, book that's probably you've been working on for years and years and years but will you, will you see publication this year we would love them to come out this year and we're definitely aiming to have them out this year um, so one of the books isn't related to this project. Um, so one of the books is with Matthew Whittle and it's on global literature and the environment. Um, so it's aimed at students and it's really thinking about um, how can we um, think about the role of literature, but also literary studies um, in addressing the climate and ecological emergencies. So uh, again, it's, it's quite off topic, so I won't talk too too long about that. Um, but but yes, it's it's we we look at literature from all over the world, and we think about how literature engages with first the earth, then water and ice, the air, and then life. Um, there are some South African texts in there, so we do look very briefly at um, Olive Schreiner's Undine, um, her first abandoned novel, as well as Peter Abraham's Mine Boy from 1940 I think I'm going to say six but it might be eight <laughs> so uh, we look at those two South African texts and we look at Henrietta Rose Innes's Green Lion as well much more recent text and um, so there is some South African literature in there but then the other um, book is the edited collection and this is where we think about um, Olive Schreiner's writing networks and global contacts um, so she hasn't, there has, this work hasn't been done yet, so it's really exciting. We've got, like I said, we've got contributors from all over the world working on this. And what we're trying to do is position Schreiner in relation to ideas and debates um, within her lifetime, but also far beyond the places that she inhabited um, and um, the times that she inhabited. So we're looking, first thing, you know, some of her kind of more intimate connections. So I look at her friendship with Margaret Harkness, for example, and how they express, uh, they both express socialist and feminist arguments, but using forms that come from different literary genealogies. So Shriner uses um, religious allegory as an influence to create modernist writing. And Margaret Harkness uses French naturalism as an influence to create modernist writing, but they both end up using the same kind of tropes and techniques to put forward socialist and feminist arguments. Um, but then we've got other contributors working on um, Shriner's relationship to Virginia Woolf and how they both might be thought of as eco-feminists. And then we look at Shriner in circulation in the Swedish press, for example, and the Dutch press. So how was she received by the Dutch feminist press and how was her work circulated there? Um, how she was, um, how her writings was used, uh, were also used in the anarchist press in the States. There's um, a lovely chapter um, which I think is really interesting, which traces Olive Schreiner's influence on Howard Thurman, 
who was Martin Luther King's main teacher and how um, Schreiner's influence can be traced from, from, from Schreiner to Thurman and finally to Martin Luther King. Um, and, and that idea of dreams is really important because like Schreiner wrote lots of allegories based on dreams. And of course we have the I have a dream speech from Martin Luther King. So really interesting connections. And um, I'm just picking out a few examples here. Um, but then um, we also have how Schreiner influenced new women writers in New Zealand. Um, and how Schreiner influenced the development of Australian modernisms in Australia. Um, I'm trying to think of any other ones. I'm reading the chapters now. I'm trying to remember which other ones. And um, Andrew's writing on Schreiner's Kutzia, so Olive Schreiner's influence, or how, or how J.M. Kutzia engages with, with Olive Schreiner as well. So a whole, a whole rich array of, of um, chapters in that collection. Well, that sounds absolutely brilliant. And I think, you know, for anyone who, I was luck luckily, um, I spent quite a lot of my youth uh, in Germany and was taught in Germany. German schools well Olive Schreiner is actually taught she's on she's on sort of reading lists uh, when in my sort of teen years which is you know quite lucky for me but so it does mean I think that you know once you once you start to sort of read little even little bits of her writing you can kind of see how yeah just how fa it's the, it's just the fascination with her brain I suppose that's always sort of struck me but you can kind of understand how globally she could be just so astounding to people especially the first time you read her. I think so. I think a lot of people can remember the first time they read the story of an African farm. It really is quite, you know, quite eye opening to have this kind of iconic feminist character, Lyndall, um, really kind of, you know, laying out these long explanations for the, you know, you know, the necessity of feminism. And she's in a, you know, on the colonial frontier in a, in a, on an ostrich farm. Um, and she's a child um, character that's, that's that's conveying these really important pioneering ideas and and even I've got I think I've got a quote here from you know trying to receive a lot of fan mail from people who'd read you know the story of an African farm when it first came out and there's a Lancashire like a working class Lancashire woman who wrote to Shrine to say of the protagonist Lyndall I think there is hundreds of women what feel like that but can't speak it but she could speak what we feel just how, how brilliant is that and how brilliant that that and that letter reached her that's that's just amazing yeah. absolutely yeah. amazing mm -hmm. well I think uh, well I'm looking forward to the book so I was, shall I start petitioning your uh, publisher to get it out this year <laughs> oh, <we're> writing it <laughs> <laughs> well but you you yeah. can get on that um I think obviously we could we could talk for much much longer but I think we will draw it to a close here um Jay, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I, that was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, if anyone wants to find out more about your research, can they go anywhere? Can, can it be found? Is it in, sort of in the public domain? It is. We've got a website, www.southafricanmodernism.com. <laughs> Well, I'm sure that all our watchers are going to be rushing there after this. So um, thank you again for joining us. 